So just while I'm setting up, uh, what kind of background do we have? Like what, maybe go through and tell me a little bit like what every two is studying so I know how to tailor this a little bit better to your interests. Um, I'm a bio sci major. Okay. Yeah. Fourth year psychology major. Oh, okay. Third year neuroscience major. Second year pharmacology. Third year neuroscience. Third year econ. Fourth year neuroscience. Okay, good. So we have a nice little spectrum today. This is, this is, a, this is broad enough. Good. Okay, so I, I, I will kind of build on what Kim talked about earlier. And, uh, and in terms of being able to visualize and understand the wealth of data that's coming into our world, I'm, before I start, who's seen, who saw some of my talks from last term? Did anyone watch the videos? It's very much okay if you didn't. Yeah, Kim. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's very okay if you didn't. I'm going to use the same slides as the second, the second lecture I gave last term, but I'm giving a different spin on things. I'm going to try and really hammer home a, a more transhumanist agenda today in, in terms of how I present the materials. So um, I'm assuming you, you got a plenty, pretty good understanding of AI from the, the previous lectures. I, you could all define machine intelligence for me. and Actually, someone define machine intelligence for me. Anyone? It doesn't have to be right. Most of our definitions aren't right either. Um, I'm just interested to see what kind of... Uh... Good, okay, very brave, a very brave soul. What about, um, so I, I think maybe inter machine intelligence would be the ability of a machine to perhaps adapt to its environment or solve problems. Like anything in the code that allows it to do that would entail some sort of machine intelligence. Awesome. Okay, great. I like that you hit on adaptability because that's, that's something that will come into play today. Anyone else want to take a crack at it before we, before we dive in here? No? Nobody? No? No more neuroscience? No? no? Okay. All right. So let's start. So I'm going to give you hopefully a, uh, uh, with a, uh, understanding that you've had a background in already in the, in the other AI segments of the course, I'm going to try and give you another view into how machine intelligence really plays into our ability to not only assist with our daily lives and augment it, but also to replace functions, for instance, functions that have been lost through injury or illness. So look at how we can use intelligent systems to make life better in both a medical context and a, and a everyday life even for non-medical situations, and how we might be able to even go beyond a little bit, to go beyond just replacing or restoring function to actually giving humans abilities that they may not have had before we had machine intelligence. So. Uh, I'm just going to go over a few learning objectives first here. One is that I'm hoping you're going to be able to define things like I just said, define assistance and augmentation, or be able to at least have some concrete picture in your mind of what I mean by these terms. Uh, also, understand the challenges to interfacing a human and a complex system. This could be an assistive artificial limb. This could be a neuroprosthetic device. Uh, this could be your smartphone. So there's going to be some uh, concrete challenges to interfacing, and you should be able to understand those challenges. And then also be able to state why machine intelligence is important to those kinds of interfaces, and specifically human-machine interaction. Also, just to dive a little bit farther in, we're going to understand what kind of abilities machine intelligence might be able to support or supplement or augment. Things like human sensation, our ability to act actuate or interact with our world, and our ability to process information that's coming in from our world. This, this fits in with what Kim was talking about in his, in his talk. So. Uh, to do that, we're going to understand how machine intelligence might actually be implemented within a human-machine interface. So I'm going to give you two concrete examples, little tiny examples, but hopefully this fits into what you've heard so far about AI and makes it, makes it concrete. And finally, I'm hoping you'll be able to give examples of how machine intelligence can actually enable better assistive technologies and better augmentative technologies. So that's our roadmap for today, and that's where I'm hoping we'll all get to. So at the end, we can sort of say whether or not that actually happened. Okay. So a key question here, this is a rhetorical question, we don't have to go out into the audience again, I've, I've put you through enough already for the near term, um, is, is what do you want to achieve that you do not have the ability to achieve? That's a pretty reasonable question. It's a question that we ask, hopefully, on a, on a regular basis. Um, and in the context of this talk, maybe not what do you want machines to do for you, but in what ways can actually the use of automation or the use of technology supplement and enable those things that you want to be able to achieve? I'm not saying we should put all our problems and all our woes off in the machine. That's, uh, I think that's perhaps heading down the wrong road, but that's another argument for another day. I'm sure Kim has some defined thoughts on that. But uh, th in this case, what can intelligent technology actually help supplement? 
Um, so story time again. So uh, if, you, if you look at my video from last term, you would have seen me coming in wearing a, essentially a third arm. I had a vest system and a robot arm coming out of the chest, and I gave the whole lecture while I was actually controlling a robotic third arm. Now, I'm sorry you don't get to see it. We've been really beating that poor up, arm up quite a bit lately, and so it's not in any fit shape to come out and visit in the public. Um, but why do I have a third arm? This is a, can I justify this within the scope of my research? And the answer is yes, I can. But it's really driven by, by a longer story. And, and the story is that I, who hasn't wanted a, a third arm? OK, let's actually have a show of hands. Do you guys think a third arm would be useful? Just two people. Maybe, and then one sitting on the fence. OK, so that's reasonable. So uh, again, the story sort of has its roots back when I, when I was young. I was in high school. I played guitar in a punk band. I played guitar, and I, I sang. And so I thought, hey, you know, it'd be great to be able to play guitar and then actually hold the microphone at the same time. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to want to do, but it's really hard. You have to sort of figure out how to put your head around the stand of the microphone, and that, uh, that's, that wasn't easy. So now I don't, I don't play punk guitar anymore, at least not often. I'm getting a lot worse at it. but. Uh, I do often sit at my desk, unfortunately, instead of standing and walking, as Kim was suggesting. I sit at my desk, and I type, and I, I also have a cup of tea. Maybe it'd be great to be able to drink my tea while I'm typing. I personally think it's better to pause, drink the tea, go back to typing, but there's many tasks during daily life where it might be handy to have a third arm. So last fall, or actually last winter, I guess it would have been, it's like, you know what? No. All the grant proposals are in, all the papers are written for this particular part, part of time. I'm, I'm going to build a third arm. So I whipped one up, and with the help of some of my students, we, over the last six or eight months, we sort of whipped it into shape of having a, a nice system that can actually interact with the human body. So you can control this arm using either your muscle signals or, or things like joysticks, and it can give information back to you in, for, in the form of vibrational feedback, sort of as this very cool uh, Adam Parker, one of my students, whipped up this really cool sleeve that had vibrational uh, buzzers in it, essentially, and looked kind of like something out of the fifth element, that sort of like white strap thing. And um, yeah, it was neat, because you could essentially control the arm, and the arm could talk back to you and tell you, wow, I, you know, I'm getting really tired, or I'm hitting into something. Right now, Adam's working on this experiment where he smashes the arm into different things, and the arm starts to predict when he's going to smash into something and say, hey, stop, stop, you're going to hit something. It's really cool. So third arms could be neat, but there's all sorts of ways where we can think of less practical and more practical ways to augment human abilities in human daily life with technology. Um, so just a, re a review here, we already heard one, one good definition of machine intelligence from, from up in the crowd. Um, just as a basis, so we're all on the same page, for the, for the purpose of this talk, let's, let's agree that machine intelligence revolves around maintaining and using knowledge. Seems pretty reasonable. And by knowledge, I mean things like representation, how the data in the world is structured, prediction, forecasts or expectations about what's going to happen next, and control, ways to use knowledge to change how you're interacting with the world. I'd say machine intelligence involves using this knowledge in a purposeful way. So what are some of the strengths of machine intelligence? I, I know you've probably seen some of these already, but uh, one is enhanced control over a changing and really increasingly complex world. It allows us to actually do something that I think we've all wanted to do since the dawn of time when we were you know, sitting in caves or tents and rolling the knuckle bones of sheep, is that we can predict the future. Machine intelligence gives us maybe a thin slice or a tiny slice into the future, but intelligent technologies allows us to take a current situation and roll that situation out to say, what might be going to happen next? It's a very tiny and a very concrete form of predicting the future, and that's been a long-term human goal. And also gives, taking these together, it gives really general tools, essentially the, the universal Swiss army knife of problem solving when it comes to data and it comes to information. General tools for solving hard, hard problems. And so this could be optimizing control of very complex systems or extracting knowledge from massive amounts of data. Uh, maybe relevant to people here would be some of the medical data as well. OK, so what are some strengths? So machine intelligence is one thing, but we can also then think of systems that not only are intelligent, but also can learn. That's a reasonable thing to expect from an intelligent system, is that it also not just is intelligent, but it changes its intelligence, changes how it uses and builds up knowledge as time progresses. So, why, why would we want an intelligent system not just to be intelligent, but also to learn? Uh, one is that, well, it's important to be able to deal with unknowns. So there's times when we don't want to specify all the details, or we can't specify all the details of a problem. Machine intelligence can fill in that gap. Machine learning, specifically, can start to learn about those unknowns. Another strength of learning is the ability to deal with complexity. So systems that learn have the ability to start to handle massive input-output state spaces, essentially massive seas of data. And they can learn about each instance in that data. And most importantly, it comes back to the comment earlier, earlier, is that learning allows us to deal with change. If we're continually updating our knowledge or expectations about the world, if a system is doing this, it can actually adapt. 
can change over time during its operation. This is a very powerful, powerful technology. So, but let's talk specifically about, about today's topic, which is how we can start to apply things like intelligent systems and intelligent learning systems to human-machine interaction. Maybe the third arm I talked about earlier. Maybe it's, it's me trying to play guitar and, and actually sing at the same time. Maybe it's something a bit more relevant to society. Uh, I would definitely say the music we created was not particularly relevant to society. Um, so human-machine interaction is a really tricky problem. So who, OK, do you guys agree with that? Yeah? Do you always have a smooth time interacting with your, your computers or your iPhones? No, I certainly don't. I, <laughs> it's often nightmarish. So human-machine interaction, even in the simple case of our, our common interfaces, is often challenging. I think of myself on my old flip phone trying to, trying to text type, and I, it still takes me like 15 minutes to make a text. I, I'm not with the times. Um, but when you start to connect humans directly to machines, that problem gets even more significant. So assistance, here going back to my definitions from earlier, but assistance is one of those hard problems. And by assistance, I mean restoring or supporting innate or acquired human abilities. So one interface, that we, one, one reason we could hope to formulate a human-machine interface is to assist a human in doing something that they, they can't do. So this might be if someone's lost a particular interest to my research is if someone's lost, lost a limb. Machines can actually start to replace or restore the function of that limb, so essentially artificial limbs. Um, another case where we might want to look at interfaces is augmentation. So that means extending human abilities. This could be extending innate human abilities. You want a third arm? That's not something that we're, we're usually, uh, usually fortunate or unfortunate enough to have. So maybe that's a case of augmentation. Maybe a prehensile tail. We'll come back to it later. But uh, you can imagine it might be handy to have a prehensile tail. And so, when again, when looking for all this, we really are looking at the case of interfa interfaces. Complex, interacting systems. Human, 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 machine, machine, machine. So let's look first at assistance. This is a natural place to start. And uh, again, assistance here, we're restoring or supporting innate or acquired human abilities. And the example in this first slide is alleviating some kind of motor impairment. In this case, I'm showing you a picture of Zach Vader. So what's cool is that Zach actually has a bionic leg. You can sort of see it in the picture on, on the slides here. Let's see if I can highlight it for you. So you can see Zach's got a bionic leg there. And what's neat here is that Zach's bionic leg allowed him to climb hundreds of flights of stairs in the Chicago Willis Tower. So he actually did a, he climbed all the way up there. And what's neat is that his particular leg is interfacing with his brain via essentially re -innervation. People have gone in and surgically rewired the, the nerves in his lower leg. Targeted motor re is what this is called. I'm not the subject of today's talk, but uh, if you want to chat after, we can, I can tell you all about some of the work on TMR, both abroad and also right here at the U of A. Um, what's neat here is that, so Zach was able to, just by, really just by thinking about the motions he wanted to make, by naturally trying to make the motions, his bionic leg responded and allowed him to do some significant locomotion, which will probably relate to his long-term health if we, uh, again, go back to, to Kim's, Kim's very brief video earlier. So that's a great example. Prosthetics is a great example of, of assistance, of replacing, assistive robotics in this case, replacing a function that may have been lost through injury, through illness, through birth, birth complications. Okay. So what's another form of assistance? So uh, here we're looking actually at Maya Matarik, some work from Maya Matarik's group. And Maya Matarik is a leader in something called socially assistive robotics. So here the robot's not really like slapped right into the body. It's not glued onto the leg. It's not attached into the, into the nerves or with electrodes on the skin. Here the robot is interacting in a more of a social setting with someone. And so what, what Maya Matarik has done and, and other people have done is use robots in social settings to assist people in completing rehabilitation, deal with children with autism, and help them to fulfill their potential. So there's interesting cases where machines that are not fully connected to a human body are also used to assist or support uh, human abilities, especially if it's something like, again, trying to perform rehabilitation therapy. So, interesting case. These are two cases of assistance. In this case, we're looking at cognitive or social support. That's a reasonable, re a reasonable region for assistance as well, not just replacing physical abilities. Okay, so let's move towards augmentation. And here, I actually, I really did like the, what Kim was showing with the, the ability to zoom in on cells and be able to essentially view data in a very different way than you would normally do. Here, augmentation, again, we're looking at extending innate or acquired human abilities, not just replacing or restoring or supporting. We're actually, actually looking at actually extending human abilities. And one example here is granting improved perception. So I, don't, I didn't put the video in here just for the instance of clarity, but I encourage you to go actually look at the slides after and go check out the videos relating to this particular work. There's a link down there. And this is something called video magnification. 
So here, you can imagine that when you have a baby, essentially a newborn baby, you don't want to go in and start mucking about with the baby. You want to poke and prod it and stick things on the baby. This is not a good idea. Um, so what if you could monitor all the vital signs of the baby just by looking at the baby? Now, normally, you can maybe see the baby's breathing and maybe see how their heart is beating. But with forms of video magnification, you can actually look in. And what this group has particularly done has gone out and showed that you can actually see, uh, in particular, differences in an accentuated form. This video processing allows them to see the baby's pulse flushing on its face. So as the baby's blood is circulating and flowing through their body, you can actually see it in the skin of the baby. And the breathing is accentuated. So instead of worrying, well, is that baby actually breathing, you can actually see the chest heaving back and forth. It's ways of pulling out salient details from a stream of data and allowing a human to see that. Now you can imagine this being on a video screen, putting it into Google Glass. You can imagine all sorts of things, but extending our ability to perceive the world in many different ways. This might be just how we look at a particular piece of data. It might be how we view the world in an everyday situation. You can see small differences magnified if they're important differences. Machine intelligence can help actually do that magnification and select what is magnified. It's an important part of this, this loop between being able to extend our control into the world and be able to see the world in more textured or more rich or more full context. Um, this is just, again, the second example is, the, is the, the baby's breathing. But again, I encourage you to go and look at these videos and actually check it out. It's, it's quite neat. They also show cranes wobbling. So if you think of just cranes wobbling in the wind, they use video magnification. You can see the crane, like these big crane towers and construction towers actually swaying back and forth fairly significantly. Uh, there's some really neat stuff. So what about other kinds of augmentation? Now, maybe some of you have seen, can you see the slide well enough there? Yeah, some of you may have seen this. It's the, uh, the HAL system, the hybrid assistive limb made in scuba Japan. Um, and what's really neat about the system is it's a strap-on exoskeleton which allows people to magnify their physical abilities. This could be used in, in elder care for caregivers to essentially allow them to move people from bed to bed and actually help, help people. It could also be used by people who actually have failing physical abilities to amplify their own strength and be able to go out and go to the grocery store and actually carry home large shopping bags. There's some neat examples of carrying many bags of rice. Um, and here, it's been actually modified for disaster recovery. Post-disaster post in Japan, they, this uh, Cyberdyne was actually building it such that they could actually put on uh, hazardous, hazardous containment suits and actually lift large objects and boxes, maybe throw away a boulder blocking the entrance to a nuclear power plant. So this is an example of physical augmentation. But one other one is actually something you may have seen, which is the, uh, the Da Vinci surgery system. This is kind of a form of physical augmentation as well. So it's a multi-arm surgery system. You can go in, perform minimally invasive surgery, uh, and the physician will actually be interacting with this robot to drive around the end effectors of, of the robot system. And there's lots of arms there. In fact, I would hazard that there's far more arms than the, than the person who's actually operating it has. So maybe third arms aren't so crazy. Huh. The ability to control a massive number of actuators is something that's actually quite impressive and powerful. And it's a form of augmentation, extending your control in the world and your ability to actuate the different parts of your world. So robot surgery is a great example of that, to be able to go in and have all these different parts moving in a coordinated and fluid way. And right now, in many complex systems like this, you often move parts sequentially. Sometimes parts move themselves, but often it's very sequential. So these are all cases of augmentation and assistance. Is everyone pretty, pretty good with that? That was one of our objectives, so we have to sort of take that off. Yeah? Assistance? Augmentation? Good. Um, OK. So the key idea here, then, let's, let's wrap that all up into a nice parcel, is that machines, not even machine intelligence, but machines can help replace and extend innate human abilities. Does everyone believe me when I say that? Yeah? Yeah, it's good. I mean, you pick up a cell phone, you can call someone across the world. That's a pretty useful form of extension right there. So machines can do this. That's a good, that's a good thing. So let's look at interfaces. What allows this to happen? It's the interaction between the human and the machine, the machine and the machine. Interfaces are what really glue together this assistance and augmentation. So let's zero in and actually look at that interface. Look at the connection and talk about the connection in, in its own terms, not where it hits the skin, but how information flows between two systems, two connected systems. So in particular, this is a, this is a, a form of large-scale information processing, especially with this, this flood of data which we're seeing in the modern world. And there's three notable challenges here. The first I'm going to talk about is increasing or expanding a signal space, where you only have, say, a joystick and you want to control an entire helicopter. Decreasing or focusing a signal space, recording all the signals from your human body and trying to figure out how to, to move a robot limb on only one or two of its joints. But these are both forms of a general case, which is matching. You have signals, input and output signals of one system, input and output signals of another system, and you have to find a way to virtuously match those signals. 
So what's the first case? Here, again, my particular area of interest is artificial limbs, replacing robot or synthetic body parts when, when someone's lost a limb. So here we have a human user, let's say someone with an amputation, and their robot limb. So an increasing or expanding signal space would be if we, if we only had, say, one or two places to sample information from the human body. In the case of recording from muscle signals, this is, this is often the case. And at the same time, we want to control one or more joints of a robot limb. The, on the slide right now, you see we have the case where we're really looking at controlling a single joint of the robot with a single pair of signals from the human body. I think it's pretty immediate how you might go about doing that. You sort of measure a signal here, measure a signal here, which one's bigger, and you just send that out to the robot limb, and the, the robot elbow moves up and down. So that's a pretty easy case. But what happens if you have more joints? And we still have a limited ability to record from the human body. And this is often the case in a clinical environment. We have limited recording sites. So what do you do here? That's an, that's an excellent question. One case is switching. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but you have four or five Da Vinci arms to control. Maybe you switch between each arm. Say, now I'm going to control these little micro forceps. Now I'm going to have a little micro scalpel. Uh, you, could control, you could switch your control between the many functions or modes of an assistive system. It's a pretty reasonable thing to do. But really, the, the, the grand goal here is, well, what if we have this vast or massive signal space in, in the system we're connecting to? How do we go about taking that limited, even if we had some, some measure of someone's intent in a few of their signals, how do we expand out to that, that grander signal space? So this is a key problem. I want just, we're not going to solve it just yet, but let's just say uh, it's a problem. The flip side is also a problem. Let's say we can record many signals from the human body, and we need to focus those down to control a smaller signal space, a small part of a robot limb. Can anyone think of a really good example of when we might want to do this? Maybe someone from neuroscience? Yeah, yeah, over there. Maybe for a reflex, if, um, like with a stepping reflex, sometimes if you're off balance, your whole body will move versus mm -hmm. just the other leg or that given leg. Mm -hmm. It's reasonable. Again, we're fusing, fusing, I think something that hits on this is fusing massive amounts of information to affect some kind of control change or control, modal control change. Um, I like uh, one good example I like is actually, well, let's, let's think, go back to just even recording. So let's pull signals out of the human brain. People like to do this. They like to build little tiny chips with tiny needles on them. And they stick them right into the cortex. And they're like, hey, let's record signals. And often they get a lot of signals sometimes, you know, 10 by 10 array grid. And you get, you get 100 signals from the brain. How would we go about using those signals or even the peripheral nervous system to control one or two joints on a robot limb? Here again, could be the body. Let's zero in. And you actually have that electrode array in the brain. You get all these, these signals out, these recordings, these neural recordings out. You need to focus them down to actually control a specific part of the actuator space, to control some kind of mode or some kind of function. This is a reasonable thing to do. Um, and if you look at some of the work that's been done even down at Pittsburgh, we'll come back to this later, but some of the work of people like Andy Schwartz, where they're recording for populations of neurons and trying to find the patterns. Jose Carmina does this as well. Like finding patterns in the neural activity and then focusing this down to control one or more joints of a robot or the position of a robot's end effector, that's a valuable and important domain as well. How do we do that? How do we focus a signal space? But again, these are really cases of matching signal spaces. One side has certain complexities, the other side has certain complexities, and how do we make those complexities line up? Because really, we're going to get the situation, especially as our assistive technologies get more complex and our ability to record from the human body gets more complex, we're going to rapidly get the situation where we have a giant mess of signals here and a giant mess of signals here, and there's going to be no clear way for us, no matter how good an engineer we are, no matter how good we are as a scientist, to manually go about connecting this, these two signal spaces. We're already at that point, I'd say. So we need something to fill that gap. And that gap doesn't have to be, again, between just the human body. It could be between the human brain and the synthetic body. I have on the slide there, synthetic body, because I put an oval for the head. Obviously, that, that changes everything. Um, but it could be. People have seen maybe the movie Avatar. Yeah. OK. So things like that. It's perfectly reasonable to want to control the synthetic body or extend your body into a, another place, into a hostile environment, an undersea environment. I personally like scuba diving, but if I was going too deep, it gets really cold. I'd want to send a synthet synthetic body down there. Um, or anything. This is the real, how do we connect anything to anything? And in particular, how do we connect the human body and the human brain to anything? That's tricky. So I think the key idea here, let's, let's boil this section down to a key idea, is that there's often a really challenging disparity between the number of signals 
and also the kind of signals on both sides of an interface. And here we're talking really about a human and a machine interfacing. But I, I, I think this holds for any kind of interface. And what I'm going to propose to you, and I think we can, uh, we can take a nice concrete look at, is that machine intelligence can be the glue that makes that, that connection. If our ability to engineer a connection between two complex signal spaces is, is diminishing and will be diminishing at a very rapid rate in, in proportion to technological change, machine intelligence is one module that we can put in there to deal with that complexity, to scale up, and deal with that adaptability and that uncertainty. Remember those things I said machine learning was especially good at earlier? Those very same things allow us to help deal with this interfacial problem. Is that good? Everyone feels like they got a good handle on interfaces? Yeah? OK, great. So what are some areas for assistance and augmentation? We talked about them already. One was sensation, the ability to perceive the world, to perceive important facets of the world. Um, again, this could be someone's lost their sight and finding a way to have a technology provide vision back to that person. Or it could be, like we saw with accentuating the, uh, the blood flow signals in, in images of a human infant, it could actually be accentuating the way to perceive facets of the world or fusing more data, be able to intuitively know the, the stock tickers all around the world at any given time or the price of oranges in, in Hong Kong. So the other area here is, is actuation. How can we go about influencing the world? We looked again at the case where someone's lost a limb. OK, so maybe you want to be able to replace that kind of control over the world, replace, replace that ability to actuate the world. Or maybe, as we looked at, it's something like having many arms in a da Vinci surgical robot. Or maybe you're wanting to go out into outer space and mine an asteroid. I don't know if that's a good idea. I kind of like them as they are. But maybe you want to be able to control all the different arms of a, of a space mining system. Who knows, right? This is really cool. So you can either replace or you can augment functions in the control. And information processing, the structure and the fundamental arrangement of knowledge. This is something that's really cool. There's some, actually some neat work on, on people who are who've been looking at the way that memory is stored in the brain and the different mechanisms in the brain that allow memory to think, uh, perceptions and, and experience to come in, be consolidated and then stored in the brain. And they've been looking at people that have actual defects, usually through injury, in their brain that prevent them from actually consolidating memory and actually storing long-term memory. And what they're working on is a way to actually have a synthetic bridge, essentially a chip that the information goes out of the brain, pure neural signals go out of the brain, and this system actually helps give the right kind of input signals so that the brain can actually store long-term memory even after that module's been, been destroyed. Now, that's a case of assistance. You're replacing a function that's lost. You can also imagine cases of augmentation where you suddenly have maybe a third lobe of the brain. Pe maybe some people have heard me talk about this before, uh, but this is, this is one idea. Why not have a third lobe to your brain? How would you go connecting that third lobe? Is that a good idea? I don't know. I'm not sure that it is. I'm not really sure that it is. But this is another case of information processing. We shouldn't, list, we shouldn't limit our thoughts about how we can extend or augment our abilities just to, just to perceiving and just to acting. We should also think about it in terms of fundamentally how we approach the use, maintenance, and acquisition of knowledge in the world. OK, so then back to the idea of machine learning. The question we can ask is, well, what, what could we start learning? And one thing we could learn is, is sensation. Sensation is related to things like prediction, forecasting the future. We can learn actuation. This is a form of control learning. And we can learn information processing, which is a form of representation learning. And so maybe, maybe you heard about this in the earlier AI lectures. Yeah? Things like representation learning, predictions, control. A little bit? OK. We'll leave that for now. Let's, let's, let's actually have a concrete example. I think it, yes, I do. This is my concrete example, my first of my two concrete example slides. So, in the interest, oh, okay. So, in the interest of time, I think I'll go very quickly through these since I think we're uh, we're moving towards our question period. Uh, but one he one example here is well, how could we? Let's say we're taking signals from a human brain. Just humor here. We're putting some electrodes into a brain. We're recording signals, and we have a robot limb. Let's say with three joints. So, one way we could learn to connect those two is is through labeled examples. And this is actually what's done in a lot of the pattern recognition work and some of the work that we the really exciting work with people controlling uh, controlling robotic limbs using, using direct brain recording, plugs right in the brain. So one thing you could say here is, OK, well, let's say we put a learning system in between these two. We put, put some computational glue, let's say, universal glue, I like to call it, put it in there. And we tell the person, think about moving your wrist. You know, try to move your wrist. Even though you don't have a wrist or you have no access to your wrist, think about moving your wrist. OK? And we record the pattern. And now we tell the learning system, OK, that pattern, that pattern you just saw relates to moving a wrist. We tell the person, move your wrist. We tell, the, we tell the, uh, the learning system, this output should be wrist. And the system updates in its internal structure. It memorizes, and I'm going to say memorizes, that pattern, and then says, OK, that relates to wrist motion. And maybe you'd give it many examples of, of different patterns that all relate to wrist motion. 
and I'd be able to start to process, generalize, figure out what aspects of the pattern that's coming into it are related to, it's making a connection, to that output of wrist signal. And similarly, you might say, OK, well, why don't you, uh, so again, it goes and moves the wrist. Why don't you think about moving your elbow? So now a different pattern appears on all those electrodes, a different, a different class of patterns, I'll say. Not just a single pattern, but a class of patterns distributed through time and space. And now you can say, and this relates to elbow motion. Learning system updates its structure, and now when it sees that pattern in the future, it moves the robot elbow. Okay, this is like your whirlwind five-slide introduction to the entire field of pattern recognition and supervised machine learning. So, it, and this is one very concrete and very powerful way of going about approaching this problem. But that's not the only way. I mean, we can learn from labeled examples, and it's really effective, especially when the domain is very well specified, but it may be very, very complex. And this is often done through sort of like I just showed you. You may record a bunch of examples and then give them to the learning system, and it sort of compresses them all down, and, and it's done offline before someone's actually using a system. And there's another approach, though. Like, we're only look at two. There's many approaches. We'll look at two today, though, because they're nicely contrasting. Uh, the other is through, why don't we let the system learn through trial and error? Okay, this is kind of weird. Kind of like training a, training a neural decoder, kind of like you train a puppy. That's maybe strange. Maybe it seems un uncommon. But again, we do more or less the same thing. We would say, think about moving your wrist. That's a reasonable thing. And the learning system would say, oh, OK, I'm going to pick an action. I'm going to try to do something. The, the system is learning through trial and error. Essentially, it tries to respond to the input pattern in a given way. And if that's incorrect, like it is in this case, it's moving the elbow, not the wrist, it actually is rewarded or punished for how well it manages to perform the action. This is really kind of cool. I mean, I'll tell you why it's cool in a second. So let's just look at this. When it gets that reward, it updates its internal structure it may change its way that it chooses actions in the future, change the way it explores or tries things out in the world. Um, now when it picks action two in response to that signal, maybe you give it a positive reward. You say, good job, you picked the right thing. And I'm just telling you, like, this is a choice of picking door one versus door two, but it works in smoother domains. Um, and again, the learner would update its policy. So what's nice about this? Well, one thing that's really nice about this is that you don't really have to know much about the domain in question. Like, you can say, OK, I know that I'm getting some kind of signals. I know I have this really complex, let's say I'm trying to not control just a single robot arm. Let's say I'm trying to control an octopus arm. There's like, you know, all these little bendy bits and things here. You, we, let's say we fit a, like a robotic octopus arm onto someone instead of a, a conventional prosthesis. And you're trying to figure out, well, I want the octopus arm to do this like weird squiggly thing. I have no idea how to program it to do that. In response to neural signals, I would never have an idea how to do that. But I know when it's done it. I can say, yeah, you did that. Or you're doing something so very different that this is obviously very wrong. So we can give a, a scalar, a single signal that says how good or bad a system is doing. And it can use that autonomously to begin to change how it interacts with the world. That's very different from the supervised case I showed you earlier, where we have an input pattern, and we tell it exactly what the right output is supposed to be. It's like me giving you a multiple choice test. In the first case, you try something, you try like, you pick A on the first question, like is augmentation, let's say, what is augmentation? It's like A, B, C, or D, and maybe, maybe D is like going out for a cheeseburger, and you pick D, going out for a cheeseburger. And I say, no, 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 the right answer is augmentation is, is actually extending innate human abilities, and that was B. You should have picked B. And you're like, right, it's not cheeseburgers, it's, it's extending abilities. And next time you see that exact question, you're going to go back and you're going to pick B, right? Trial and error learning is that you pick D going for a cheeseburger, and the system says, nope, that was really bad. Next time, you have to go try a different one. Maybe you pick A, which is not going for a cheeseburger. It's also wrong. And so it's like, oh, OK, that's still bad. And then maybe you pick C, which is even better. So the idea here is that there's different ways that you can actually cause a learning system to change its internal structure. And by relationship here, I also mean there's many ways you can cause an interface or the connection between two complex systems to begin to change its internal structure and to remap. And depending on how well we know our problem and how well we're able to sort of suss out exactly what we want to be done, we can use any of these different kind of learning approaches to achieve the results we want. And what's neat about the trial and error case, and this, again, my research is largely in, in the, the trial and error case or in the real-time learning case, is that, yeah, it can be done in real time. So instead of recording a bunch of examples and then doing this while the system is sort of at, asleep at night for processing and compiling, this can actually continue. It can continue to learn about someone, predict what they're going to do, and help improve their control while they're interacting with the system. This speaks towards that, uh, I mentioned at the beginning, transhumanism, extending human, human, uh, human abilities, moving beyond just a simple human body to a human-machine hybrid body. Yeah, these are all sort of big ideas. But if a system can continue to learn and continue to adapt while it's being used, then you can have co-adaptation. 
And there's some neat papers. There's one from down in Florida, actually. Uh, I think it's Jose Principe's group from down in, in Florida, where there's actually a rat and a, a trial and error learner, a reinforcement learning system that are both co-adapting to try and move the robot arm to, uh, to grab small objects from a space. And the rat has essentially plugged right into its brain. And the robot arm and the rat are working together. They're both learning. And they're both adapting to be able to solve a task. OK? So this is, uh, this is the general case. So I'm just going to show you the general case here. And then we're going to move into some wrap up. But the general case here is usually we have some kind of controller. It has some parameters. And it has some mapping where it takes information about the world. And it turns that information into control actions, say, for a robot limb. All right. And often, there's some kind of knowledge built into that mapping. Often that knowledge is in the form of predictions. If I see this signal, I should take this kind of control action. And what, I've, what I'm trying to sort of propose here, and I've sort of led you up to in the last few slides, is that maybe it makes sense to actually pull out that intelligence, pull out that predictive model or that body of knowledge and facts, and make that discrete. And then we can use that to, for instance, influence the, the parameters. I'm going to predict the future. If I'm in this situation and I'm doing this, maybe I'm reaching for the mouse. Every time we've done this before, I've reached for the mouse. So I can predict that we're reaching for the mouse and use that to improve the interface between a human and, say, an assistive robot arm. That's a pretty natural thing to do. You can also use it to directly change the mapping. You can give those predictions as inputs, as new inputs to a control system. This is, uh, I've, I've seen uh, there's a, a technique called model predictive control. Usually it revol revolves around a lot of engineering and knowing a lot about your domain. But essentially it's been likened to, well, why would you drive a car looking in the rearview mirror? You want to look ahead and see what's coming down the road. Predictive information allows us to look ahead and look down that road and be able to use that information to improve our control. These are natural ways to start using and maintaining and deploying knowledge. And uh, you can also just use that directly in, in control actions. But what's neat here is that, uh, and I haven't, done, I haven't used this slide before. This is a, sort of, I decided to throw this in because, again, on the transhumanism aspect of today's lecture, is that what's neat here is that we don't have to think about this influencing the control system of a, some kind of distributed or different system. You can have the same predictive model being fed right back into the human brain. I talked about augmenting our ability to process the world, store information about the world. Well, you can have a digital system not just supplementing your control of a robot prosthesis, but you could imagine all those predictive facts might be of great interest to your brain. Maybe they're kind of predictions, because of the nature of the data, predictions that our wetware doesn't do a good job of predicting. It doesn't do a good job of storing. But maybe hardware does a great job of doing that. Maybe actually computational hardware can process data in a much more limited context, but in a more complete context, and then provide that as feedback back to the brain. Maybe even in, in terms of, uh, so, as the neuromorphic engineering people would like, in terms of actual signals the brain can handle, neural spiking trains. That's kind of cool. Let, let's just keep that in our mind. So here's the key idea from all of this, is that finding structure in the data and maintaining up-to-date knowledge can actually be really useful when domains are changeable, non-stationary, when, when we have that wild situation of two really complex spaces that are interacting and, and merging and meshing. Um, so here's one example. Uh, many of you have probably seen this example, but this is from, again, from the folks down at the University of Pittsburgh, where uh, Jan Truman here actually has a, an implant, a neural implant. It's recording directly from her brain. Uh, she's paralyzed from the neck down, and she's using that neural implant to control that robot arm to feed herself a chocolate bar, and also peppers and various other things, and taking sips from water bottles. And that's pretty miraculous. I think, does, is everyone kind of impressed by that? You have a plug right in the brain, and you're controlling a robot arm, even though you're completely paralyzed. That's really spectacular and miraculous. Um, and there's examples now. There's one group that's even saying that there's, there's wireless electrodes. So you could stick electrodes in and actually wirelessly record from the brain and then control devices. OK, so this is really neat. But, and I always say this is really neat. And I think it is really neat. But are there, are there limitations? Are there things we should think about when we're looking at this? So one is, well, uh, how stable is the interface? And the answer is that often the interface is very unstable. So the brain changes. The systems change. The world changes. And Right now, the, our classical approach to interfaces is actually not able to handle that change. This is a, maybe people will yell at me after this, and I'll get angry emails from other scientists. But really, our interfaces at this point are not capable of changing and adapting along with the system. Usually, we have to retrain. Remember that sort of training, the labeled examples training I showed earlier? We often have to retrain that kind of thing every single time we want to use a, a neural device like this. Um, and also, often these devices are controlled in a very engineering-focused way kind of like using a joystick. So we sort of take neural signals, and we try to put them into buckets. Or we try to put them into like a, some kind of, like, OK, this is up, this is down, this is left, this is right. And we have them essentially pilot the end of the robot limb, like we'd be using a joystick to pilot the limb. And this is a natural and reasonable thing to do. This is a great thing to do. But it may not actually solve the problem of interfacing complex systems. 
It's very much an engineering style approach. And as the interfaces get more complex, replace that arm with an octopus arm where we may not know the kinematics or dynamics. Maybe it's soft robotics. Maybe the system is part biological. Maybe that robot system we're attaching to ourselves is growing and changing. Our ability to engineer those interfaces is not going to be very good. We're not going to have the capacity to engineer a solution to complex interfaces. So this is miraculous work, and it sets the stage for really good things and, and really hopefully improve quality of life for people that, that, are, that are facing uh, motor impairments and, and the inability to control their body because of injury or illness. But to really solve this problem, I'm going to say that we need much more principle, a much more principled approach to the interface itself. And that's underpinned by machine intelligence and, and looking at the connection of complex systems. Now, so some open questions. We're going to just quickly rip through these. Is that, OK, so we talked about when, when signals and information are plentiful, how do we actually gain function without losing function? If I were to stick a prehensile tail on one of you, let's say you. Let's say I stuck a prehensile tail on you. Like, how would you go about controlling that? Maybe I really, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I like putting people on the spot. Sorry. I, I, I'm assuming it would be based on maybe, I don't know, you could, you could imagine what it would be like based maybe on your exposure to it, like in the media or thinking, uh, no one knows, I don't know. <laughs> well, that's the thing, right? So, I mean, okay, let's say that you are recording. I mean, I'd probably like wiggle my butt or something trying to figure out how to make this thing work. But it's not clear. You'd have to focus on it and you'd have to really devote a lot of your cognitive and physical architecture to making that piece work. If I were to slap electrodes all over your arm and you could move your arm to control your tail, maybe you'd get a full and comprehensive control of your tail, but you sacrifice the use of your arm. You have to say, I'm using my hand and my arm to control the tail. So this is an open question. How would you go about you know, controlling a pair of wings? You always think, well, I'd probably just do this with my arms. And that doesn't, I mean, maybe that's kind of what I see birds doing, but I don't think that's right. And, or an internet spider. Really, we need a good continuous and low cognitive bandwidth interface to be able to control like how a, a small web crawler is moving through the giant massive sea of data on the internet. It's not an easy question to answer. Is how we, we, even if we have an infinite amount of information we can record from the human body, it still causes us to sacrifice something to get something. And maybe in biological connected systems that sacrifice is not quite so significant. Okay, and the opposite is this is when signals of information are scarce, how do we gain extra information from limited data? So I'm gonna ask someone else a similar question is that if I were to, you know, give you, I'm gonna give you three buttons. Let's, I'll, I'll, I'll pick on you again. You, you answered a question already, so, but I'll still pick on you. Let's, you have like, I give you three buttons, and how would you fly an airplane or drive a race car using only those three buttons? Use trial and error and see what button does what, and then see how everything works, and then try to coordinate. Yeah, well, you have three bits of information. You can say button one is on and off, button two is on and off, button three is on and off. You, you only have three pieces of information, but if you've seen the inside of an airplane cockpit, there's a lot of stuff in there. So like, is there any clear way you can think of to actually go between those buttons in that giant airplane cockpit? Yeah, oh, yeah, well, okay, because if you actually have an answer, please let me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so perhaps in that scenario, like perhaps the timing of the buttons would be uh, crucial to yeah. piloting the plane to. Because like, perhaps if you tap one button three ah. times and maybe alternate between one and two, like it gives you different controls and the, perhaps it controls ah. the ailerons or the rudder, yeah, ah. thrust, stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, so this is really cool. And this is actually a viewpoint that people don't usually take is that time is important. People usually are scared of time. Uh, one of my mentors, Rich Sutton, says this very much, that, that people are scared of the temporal aspect of data. But the street, the, how, the, how the spikes come down our, our nerves, how, how the information and data is sequenced is critical. So yeah, that's one actually, so maybe this is a good stab at that, is that we have to be able to better respect and extract information from the time series of data, not just from pairs of labeled examples. And most of our work now is on pairs of labeled examples. So this is really cool, and it goes more towards the real-time approach, which is, of course, why I'm biased. Uh, right up front, I'm biased. I think this is a cool idea. Um, but this is good. So these are the big questions. These are hard questions. These are unsolved questions. And as I, again, I like the prehensile tail example or the pair of wings because I can't really think of how I do that without having to figure out a way to like, coordinate, do some kind of like funky chicken dance to make the, the, tail, the tail actually work. Um, so, but again, the, this is my stab at a possible solution. It's a bit of a cop-out because it's a very generalized approach. But let's solve AI. 
Let's solve machine intelligence. Let's solve human-machine interaction and maybe one of the pathways is singularity. Maintaining and using knowledge, representation, prediction, control in a purposeful way may be one of the doorways to let us do all those things that I can't quite think about how to do right now. Because maybe it won't be me that's doing the thinking. Maybe it'll be a collection of me and some kind of night third lobe that is all computational that, that's actually able to solve those problems. Maybe that's where we're going. Is that a good idea? I don't know. I see heads that are sort of innately shaking in different directions, but that's OK. So maybe machine intelligence is a good thing to help us at least explore that path and decide whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. So let's go back to our learning objectives, and then we can cross things off. And oh, we're right on time. Huh. Yes. All right. So first learning objective, do you guys think you could be able to define assistance and augmentation? Yeah? I hope so. I see nods. This is good. You can nod. You don't have to put your hands in. You're just nodding, nodding or shaking your head. Some feedback is good. We talked about feedback. This is a closed loop system. Um, OK, do you sort of understand the, the, the interfacial challenges? I don't even have to remember the three, the three cases I talked about, but do you sort of have a good idea why interfaces are not just a simple, like, I put a wire here and put a wire here? OK, good, 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 good. Uh, and also, do you think you can state why machine intelligence might be important to facilitating good human machine interaction or streamlined human machine interaction? OK, reserve nodding of heads. This is OK. Well, I'll, I'll consider that a limited win. OK, and do you, OK, let's look at what abilities machine intelligence might support. Uh, everyone's cool with the ideas of sensation actuation and information processing in some form? OK, good. More nodding, that, that makes me happy. Um, how machine intelligence is actually implemented within human machine interfaces? Remember our two concrete examples? Were those clear? Sort of? OK, I'll take a sort of. And uh, also, can you give examples of how machine intelligence might actually enable assistive or augmentative technology of the future? Does someone want to work on this? Anyone want to do research in that area? No? OK. <laughs> We're always looking for good people to think with us, so. <laughs> Excellent. So let's just close. I'm gonna, that, we'll, we'll end that right now. So I, I really just want to leave you with this thought, though, that the world is getting more complex. And if we believe all the things that we see in many of the other lectures, and maybe even the lecture on Thursday, which I think should hopefully fit nicely into this, that the complex world is going to give us a number of complex challenges. And a lot of these challenges are about how complex things interact with other complex things, and how the information flows between them. And that's non-trivial. And if we keep using the approaches that we use today, if we think about the data in the way we do today, we may not be able to actually think about those interacting systems. So let's think about the interface. Let's think about data. And let's think about specifically how machine intelligence might be able to allow us AI, machine learning, um, and all different kinds of machine technology may help us to, to go about embracing a world where data is coming in faster than we know what to do with it. Great. Hey, thanks so much. There's Question. a facet of things that I don't think the students are possibly aware of that you are a poet of some <laughs> note. I mean, you're, you're a well-known poet. You write uh, haikus. If you l do a search on your name, you're as likely to find a, po a poem as, as you are something about the subject of this lecture. And when I first met you, you said the two were absolutely disconnected, had nothing to do with each other, but now I think <laughs> You come to a re realization that they are. No, they've always been inseparable, Kim. And I think it, yeah. you probably found this as well, but you can't separate them. They can be distinct in terms of I, I don't bring, I think what you're referring to is that I don't bring my poetry into the science. I rarely right. bring the science into the poetry. But that's not to say that, they're, that they should be or could be kept distinct. You can't. They're really, right. they, they're two different ways of thinking about the world the breadth of the world and the depth of the world. Right, and, and, and I think you really need both. If you think about this lecture, this, this structure of it, it's logical statement, logical statement, oops, th this really can't be encompassed in a logical statement, but we'll try anyway. And after a while, it sort of we wears you down, you know, and a part of yourself wants to deal with the things that, 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 that are not over-intellectualized, you know. The, the, the idea of just going with the flow, going with the feeling, the way you might do in a, uh, you know, poetic phrase, I think that's why it has so, uh, so much appeal. If you put those two things together, then you, you become a, you know, complete person. Otherwise, you're like too logical, too, you know, intellectualized. You're right. And actually, I think what's really important there is that 
when you're looking, especially looking at science, you said logical statement, logical statement. It's very linear. It's very essentially one thing proceeding to the next, like a yes. chain of beads. And what's important about poetry, what makes really good poetry, in my, in my opinion, is that you have many parallel readings or many parallel ideas that are moving through a single train of text. And mm -hmm. so bringing that to science is very important. Realizing that many different concepts can exist at the same time. You don't have to collapse one probability waveform to just get one, one world. Multi-world <laughs> hypothesis for, from quantum mechanics. Everything can exist at the same time. And acknowledging that and embracing that actually helps with the, the pursuit of science. You have to be really rigorous about how you do that, but it, it's quite right. neat. You can take the same, well, how am I going to actually you know, let this metaphor all roll out? And it actually has to be the same in the science when you're, when you're pursuing the science. So, what I, what I find very satisfying is that, you know, the stereotype of a scientist, you can imagine a certain bias that maybe you naturally wouldn't like or wouldn't respect uh, poetry, right? So, so, so you're, you're living proof that that, yeah. that stereotype is wrong. Well, that said, I don't write poems about artificial limbs because I don't think they'd be very good. I'm much better at writing poems about trees and rocks and things. So I'm going to stick with the trees and rocks and uh, not try and, and couple it too tightly. I find that's where I usually start to fall down. Questions from the, uh, yeah. I just had a question about um, going back to, you were mentioning the rewards and punishments in yeah. the second system. Yeah. Um, I was just kind of, like so computers are kind of like, you think of them formulaic, very like mm -hmm. they're programmed, yeah. they're pre-programmed. Um, so how would they, get a sense of like preferring one input over another in terms of like the reward mm -hmm. and punishment. So you mean, how do we actually phrase the reward and punishment? Yeah, like is it just that you're saying that this input is good and this input is bad and you're just like writing that in code? Yeah, no, usually what we do is we, we take away their TV privileges <laughs> for the night and uh, we make sure they only eat healthy things and no dessert. And that's their negative reinforcement, although it should be positive in there. No, uh, so really what you can think of in, in the computational sense is that you can, you can hard code in goodness and badness, much like you might be able to hard code that into our biology. That certain signals are bigger on a certain signal is good, and lower on a certain signal is bad. And then you can provide essentially inputs to that signal line. Like, think you have a, I'm giving you a whole stream of input. I've got this bundle of fiber optic cables coming into, into, right into your brain, let's say, okay? And you're getting all sorts of data flashing on these cables, but I tell you one cable, this cable right here, is important. And that you want that cable to be on all the time. You don't want it to be dark. You want it to always be flashing bright light at you. Um, that's the, the analogy to providing reward. So we're actually telling a system that a single signal is special. We're hard coding that into its, into its makeup and saying optimize that signal. Does that make sense? Is that answering your question? Um, yeah, it answers my question. But like, then your, the reward itself, though, is how you say as good as bad. Is like, that's your leash on the system. If you think of your, you're taking your dog for a walk, um, how you phrase the reward or how the system interprets all the different things that are happening in the world and turns that into a reward signal is still something that's quite tricky. That's, that requires great skill because if you tell, it the, you tell it the wrong thing about reward, it will lie, cheat, and steal to be able to achieve that reward. It will, uh, it will not do what you want it to do because it's doing what you told it to do, which is optimize this individual signal. Right, and I guess maybe I was extrapolating in my own mind without making it clear in my question. Yep. I'm kind of thinking in terms of once, that, once maybe the singularity has been reached yep. um, and they're like we're theorizing that these machines are on their own will kind of mm -hmm. creating various programs or yep. doing their own things independently. Would it just be based off of the thing that you've input originally or would that be modified? Like, Does reward change? Yeah, like, so it's, what kind because of if it's hard coded, I mean, you yeah. presume well, that that wouldn't change. This is good. So looking at our biology, yeah, there's certain things like, you know, we look at Pavlov and his, and his puppies and if you like, you can see the way dopamine flows through the brain when you present it, the idea of a steak, or you condition it to see a steak after a bell and things like this. So there's some things that you can think of, okay, well, there's some mechanisms here. But let's look at other kinds of reward. So are you rewarded when you, when you feel like you've learned something? Do you feel good about that? Some people do. Some people don't. But, uh, so there's a distinction you can make. Often not, I, I just actually wrote an article saying that the distinction is maybe not useful in all cases, but between extrinsic and intrinsic reward. And we hope that all our students at the university are intrinsically motivated, that they're driven by knowledge and the pursuit of knowledge, and that actually has been shown to lead to much better performance in classes and things like that, and better synthesis of knowledge, blah, blah, blah. Okay, teaching aside. Essentially, you can think of rewards that come from within a system and rewards that come from outside a system. And in the computational sense, there's been some really neat work on intrinsic motivation, intrinsic reward, whereby a system is actually driven by its own learning progress. 
where essentially the, the change in its understanding of the world, the change in its inter internal structure in a positive way is driving essentially reward back into the system that changes how it behaves and how it interacts with the world. So reward itself doesn't have to be hardwired and fixed coming from the outside world. And the reason for that is, well, where do you draw the outside world? Let's look at you. Take you, you have a boundary, skin suit sort of interacts with the air and water and things like that, hard objects. Okay, so is that where you draw the line? Like, if I talk about you as an intelligent system, is that the right boundary to draw? Is that where you end and the world begins? Maybe? Or do we, do we go actually closer in? Do we go to your brain? Do we wrap a little shrink wrap thing around your brain and say, okay, well, you need the spinal cord. We don't even worry about that. That's just wires going down with some processing units strung along the way. Maybe your brain's where we draw the line. And, and then the world is everything outside of, outside of that little thing, that little protective envelope wrapping your brain. Is that, now, is that a reasonable place? If so, I mean, rewards are still coming in by signals, but there's a lot of reward architecture happening. Do we actually just zero down? And you're like, is your prefrontal cortex where it's at? Are we looking just up there and do all, the, all the dopamine neurons that project into it? Are th and that's definitely external reward. I mean, the reward's coming from a deeper brain structure. So the line gets really tricky and things change. The way that we wire our reward, the way that reward is processed changes over time. Long-term potentiation and depression of the, uh, of the different neurons in the brain can change the way that we respond to stimulus. Cocaine addicts have a real problem with this. So the answer is your question's a tricky one. And if we're moving towards a system where things are getting progressively malleable, then reward will be progressively malleable as well. And you could have a system that, I did, did any of you see Rich Sutton's lecture from last, uh, last term, the, the, the student presentation night? Should have been, yeah, exactly. Uh, it should be out, I, I encourage you to watch that because Rich was talking about some neat things about well, where, well, is, is the actual physical body precious? Is our intellectual body pre is actually precious in a case where you could replicate and copy yourself and you could have a copy of yourself that was optimizing for cheeseburgers on a Thursday and another copy that was optimizing for your learning progress and where you can make copies and destroy copies at will. It's a really provocative lecture. So that, couple that with the idea about, well, where is your, where is your motivation coming from? What is driving your trial and error exploration? And you get a really muddy picture but a really exciting picture at the same time. Like sort of the splatter paintings. I know my wife doesn't really like Jackson Pollock or his splatter paintings, but you can imagine an abstract art painting where you, where you actually have something interesting hidden in the mix. So does that not answer your questions in a very comprehensive way? No, it answers them. I, I, the intrinsic part is where, like, you, you say it's still muddy, and, and, and that's, <laughs> once, once you get to that point where it's intrinsic, I'm just wondering how that occurs, and, like, there's just, yeah, it yeah. gets a little crazy. There's some really but cool literature. If you want, send me a note. We can, we can chat about some of, the, some of the papers, especially on the computational side, which sort of tease it out in very simple domains. And some work by Jürgen Smidhuber, actually, in, from about 91, has a really neat paper on just the computational aspects of using learning progress to drive the change of a behavior change in a, in a system. So, and he has a good paper called something, 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 and jokes. Anyway, it's a good paper. Um, any other questions? We, I think we've got another... 7.3 minutes or something for question? Yeah? It's just a general question about the, the research you do. Uh, yeah. So you, you do work with uh, bionic arms and yeah, uh, yeah. making that stuff. So my question is, um, typically, uh, how, how many uh, neuronal signals do these uh, arms, uh, are these arms designed to uh, receive? I mean, uh, Harvard Medical School, they just took a mon two monkeys, they sedated one, and they uh, used the brain signals of the other one to uh, control it like an avatar. Mm -hmm. And that, that involved like around 100 signals. I'm mm -hmm. just wondering as to how complex your arms are, like, okay. the ones so, that you design. So the question is how, plex how complex should they be and how complex are they? Um, and they're interrelated questions. The, uh, to answer your question, let's actually look at what's being used on the street right now. So if you were to go shake hands with someone's bionic limb on, on the street right now, typically they would have, let's say they're they're transhumeral, so they have their arm amputated about here. Um, they have a socket, and the robot arm is an elbow. It's a wrist. Maybe, if they're very lucky, it's a wrist. Probably it's just an elbow, and it's a hand that opens and closes. Some of those hands you can select, like switching, like we talked about, different grip patterns. But for the most part, there's a very limited number of actuators. The signals coming into that device, is all, the signal space is also very limited. There'll be between two and four electrodes that are stuck inside that socket. And they're not stuck into the nerves, they're actually measuring from the skin. So muscles are like amplifiers for the nerves. Essentially nervous information comes down, fires a muscle, muscle generates electrical activity, you can record it from the skin, this is called myoelectrics. And most 
dominant electromechanical prostheses are now are essentially myoelectric controlled. You can take it off at night, put it in a closet, and it doesn't have any wires going into your skin. Um, so most of the work that I focus on right now is focused on that setting where you have a limited number of input signals between, say, four and eight electrodes that are attached to the skin of the arm. Or we actually are working also with um, targeted motor and sensory re -innervation. I said I wasn't going to talk about this, but the idea is that you know, our plastic surgeon can go in and actually start to rewire the nerves in the nervous system so that all those nerves that would have gone to that amputated limb are now snipped on to actual muscles in the upper arm. So now when the person thinks about closing the hand, they no longer have an actual muscle group in their upper arm fires. We can record from that. And when you poke them in that muscle group or somewhere near it, the sensory nerves also have sort of been rewired and re reattached. And so now they feel it in the hand they don't have. So we're working in that setting as well, which gives us access to uh, a greater, greater diversity of signals and a greater of both input and output. Um, but right now, the, the main focus is on, of my research especially, is on devices that will be able to, say, go out into actual use by patients in the near term. Um, that's not to say I'm not interested in the more complex interfaces. It's just we need, to, we need to start in a clear setting so that we can understand the, the actual interfacial challenges. So that, that's where, where I'm coming from, where most of my work is, is, is in something that we can hopefully get into use by amputees. Did that answer your question? Oh, sorry, just on a side note, though, we do just back on to multiple monkeys and multiple humans. We have some great, I have some great fun when people come to the lab, and I essentially have two people, and we'll hook different electrodes up to different people, different myoelectric electrodes, and they're both trying to control the arm to do the same task. It's, it's pretty good fun, and it gets to some interesting team issues, interfacial issues. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Good. Anybody else? I think we're out of time. Oh, Kim, you have a final comment? I would, I would expect you to. Yeah, so, uh, no, I, I think what's fascinating, don't you, is that in a very real way, this session worked just as well as when you had, you know, the actual arm. In other words, them, you know, fantasizing about yeah. what the arm would be like works just as, be, just as well as having the real arm here. The real arm is a little bit distracting because you haven't seen anything like that before. And so you wouldn't be listening quite as closely because sometimes you're, you're more interested in what the arm's doing than what he's saying. I'll be waving the third arm <laughs> yes. around and like completely lose the point. <laughs> and when, when the arm's not here, it, it, in a way the lecture works be better, but particularly with them knowing that they can see the arm yep. on la last terms of video, yep. you know, I mean, it, it, it sort of all works. So anyway, thank you very, very much. I, I wanted to talk with the students a little bit about Thursday, where um, we are interacting with David Pierce by Skype. Now, you, you can uh, find his previous teaching sessions uh, in this course and also other lectures of, of his, you'll, you'll recall that what I talked to him about last time, which was different from the other things we've done in previous terms, was particularly his idea about gender and the fact that if women were in charge of everything, that the world would be a much better place. And there are women, actually, who hold the opposite view, that all of the advancement of mankind, men have been responsible for that, that if women had been in charge, we'd all be living in you know, grass huts, and we wouldn't have iPhones, and you know, all this kind of thing. So what, what, what I plan to do, I, I don't think it's necessarily what he would most prefer, but, I, but I'd like to kind of challenge his idea about the fact that the world would be a much better place if women were in charge of everything, but are not, you know, territorial. And, they, and there are many things that, that men um, have as, you know, characteristics that lead to war and bloodshed and misery for uh, human beings worldwide that women just don't do, you know. Um, that, that, what, what would happen if we bring this other uh, idea that men have been responsible for most of, most of the advances of the, you know, the human species? I think it will, will be really fun to kind of challenge, challenge him to tell us what he thinks about those two things. But his main thesis, um, which when you talk about it without him here, you, 
you just kind of immediately reject, and that is getting rid of all pain and suffering. I, I don't just mean the pain and suffering you don't want, but all pain and, and uh, suffering. So like when you're feeling remorse, when, 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 when a friend leaves, all, all this sort of thing, all those kinds of things where you kind of feel, well, that pain and suffering I, I want. <laughs> <laughs> Have you, has the class read Machine Man by Max Berry? No, I don't think so. An excellent book, um, and actually at one point they're looking at actually putting the navel removing pain and suffering from the brain. So, for the brain, it's a really good piece of fiction. I, I recommend it. Yeah. Well, they, this, this, is, this is exactly, I mean, when you think of the futuristic things we talk about in this course, it's often a sort of logical leap where we don't know how we're going to do that. But with David Pierce, he can tell you the exact genes that you would want, and, and, and there are already children being born who, who have you know, genetic changes there where, where they uh, do not feel pain and that sort of, sort of thing. So it's a matter of, you, you can actually figure out how you would get exactly to the point that he's uh, uh, talking about, and then he will you know, convince you that, uh, you could lead a life where when something bad happens, you feel less happy. You don't feel pain, but you feel less pleasure or less you know, well-being than you usually feel. And what I, what I had all, also said at, at the outset of the course, it's an unusual teaching day in that if you don't listen to any of his lectures, if you don't sort of study up on him, you'll feel bad. It's not that I'll feel bad about you. I probably won't know. I won't realize that you're much less prepared than the other students. But it, it's a huge loss for you personally because you kind of feel, well, I can't ask good questions. You know, the other students are challenging him because it's, it's really funny. He's kind of the most famous person you will meet in this course and you're confronting him directly on Skype. You're looking into his eyes and you know, asking him these tough uh, questions. And the other thing that's nice about it, as opposed to uh, the Marcus Hutter uh, scenario, is he really enjoys the, uh, the uh, interaction with you. He always has. So he's looking forward to Thursday. I, uh, I hope that you are too. So it, there's no specific thing. I, I think the areas of his scholarship that interest you the most, whether it would be the pain and suffering stuff, the gender stuff, other things that he's done, read about them, bring you know, questions here, and, and uh, ask him. <laughs> so, so that's what your preparation for th Thursday is. OK, thank you very much. <laughs>